And joining us now on the debate for the full hour, in Manchester, New Hampshire, Louis Feldstein, co-chair of the Suaro Seminar and co-author of Better Together, Restoring the American Community. In Springfield, Massachusetts, Linda Trupp, professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts and author of When Groups Meet, The Dynamics of Intergroup Contact. And here in studio, Donald Forbes, professor of political science at the University of Toronto and author of Ethnic Conflict, Commerce, Culture and the Contact Hypothesis. John Barry, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Queen's University, and Gerald Owen, journalist at The Globe and Mail. Okay, folks, throughout the ages, people have tried to explain conflict between different ethnic, cultural, social groups, and other people have tried to mitigate such conflict. One of the approaches that attempts to do both explain and mitigate it is contact theory. So, John, why don't you get us started? Uh, what exactly is contact theory, and how did it come about? Contact theory was proposed by an American social psychologist by the name of Gordon Allport a little over a century ago. And he proposed that uh, on average when individuals or groups come together in contact situations, that contact will lead to uh, better intergroup relations, more positive mutual attitudes. But he also laid down some conditions under which this will work and conditions under which it will not work. Uh, the main conditions are that it should be voluntary, uh, people should not be forced into contact, that it should be between groups that are roughly equal in status, uh, not uh, very powerful and very powerless people, and there were a few other conditions as well that have emerged in the research literature since then. If these conditions are absent, then uh, the uh, hypothesis says that contact will not lead to mutual uh, regard. Okay, we're going to talk more about the conditions as we move on, but Linda, I want to ask you this. I guess putting aside those, those conditions, is contact theory as simple as increased contact means better relations? Um, I think traditionally social psychology research has been misunderstood on this front. That I think people have the impression that all things being equal, contact will always improve attitudes. And I don't think that's the case. And in particular, in recent years, people have started to focus on conditions that might undermine the positive effects of contact. So overall, yes, greater contact between groups can improve intergroup attitudes. But if there are negative forces in the intergroup relationship, that might undermine the positive potential of contact. Donald, help me out here. Is this, are you agreeing with what you're hearing from other guests? Uh, well, I have some reservations. Uh, I, I think that uh, the uh, basic uh, generalization that contact theory is built on uh, about the uh, positive effects of contact on attitudes is a sound generalization about uh, individuals, when you focus on individuals. But, but uh, uh, it's a misleading generalization if you're shifting your attention from the individuals who have the contact to the groups of which they're part. And then I don't think there is the evidence that more contact, if we're talking about contact between groups, which is of course contact between individuals also, but I don't think it's uh, 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 true that uh, in general, the more contact between groups, the uh, more positive the attitudes. Louis Feldstein, you have uh, collaborated with Robert Putnam, one of the most prolific political scientists, acclaimed social scientists of our era. He studied extensively contact theory, and one of the things that Putnam writes about is this idea that we have tools, physical capital, but, and we have human capital, but we also have something that we often think less of called social capital. What is social capital? Social capital at, at its simplest means that uh, who you know matters, that our relations of friends, neighbors, and uh, business people, and the family make a difference in our lives, and that the networks and connections and collaboration make a difference, that this hidden and not immediately visible uh, set of connections is important to the way our communities work. Why is it so useful, Lewis? It's useful because it turns out that that's the way we do a lot of our business, that if you look closely at communities, you find out that where social capital is higher, uh, communities are generally healthier, wealthier, uh, less conflict, and go about solving their problems more effectively. And, that, and I say communities, I don't mean just geographical communities. It may mean groups of business people. It may mean people grouped in any kind of a form. Social capital is an effective way 
by which people connect with one another. It describes those networks of connections. Linda, I see you nodding there. Do you agree that social capital is crucial to contact theory? I think social capital is very important. And from the, some of the examples that I saw in Lewis's book that really focus on cooperative interdependence between members of different groups where they're working together toward common goals with some sort of institutional structure supporting that type of contact, those are some of the other conditions that John alluded to uh, that help to frame contact theory. And what we find is that um, those aren't necessarily essential conditions for positive contact effects to emerge, but they are facilitating conditions such that the more we're able to cultivate cross-group relationships that involve cooperation, common goals, equal status, and institutional support, the more likely we're to, we are to observe positive outcomes from the contact. Donald, do you see it how important is social capital to the idea of contact theory? Well, they're very similar. Uh, they, they come out of uh, similar uh, background uh, theories and reasoning about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, social interaction. Um, and so they're closely related. And, uh, I th but I think that one of the interesting things that is in recent years has come out of the um, uh, research on social capital is the research that was reported by uh, Robert Putnam in his um, lecture in, in Sweden, this, the, the uh, uh, Skite, I think it's called, prize lecture, in which he, sh he uh, reported uh, a very large study of uh, American communities that showed that the, uh, basically the more diverse the community, the lower the level of social capital. And that was quite a, a, a controversial uh, presentation that he made. Okay, I want to talk about one of your studies, Donald. Uh, you know, depending on the circumstances around the contact and the groups in questions, results have, have proven, as we've discussed, to be very different. And I want to take a look at the factors established by contact theorists, which was raised earlier. This is an ex excer excerpt, pardon me, from a chapter you wrote, Donald, in uh, The Psychology of Ethnic and Cultural Conflict. Here's the quotation. For a positive outcome, you write, three major variables have been repeatedly cited as crucial determinants of contact theory's effects. First one is the quality, equality or inequality of status of the different groups in contact. Secondly, their cooperative or competitive interdependence in the pursuit of common goals. And the third one being the presence or absence of social norms supporting intergroup contact. John, that seems like a lot of conditions to meet. Uh, how feasible is it really to create contact that meets all of those requirements? Uh, in principle, all hypotheses are true under uh, a whole variety of conditions. And uh, these conditions can sometimes be extensive or sometimes uh, quite short. Uh, the conditions you've just um, alluded to from Don's work uh, can be further extended uh, and uh, related to uh, two things that have already been put on the table. One is the difference between the individual level of understanding contact theory and the group level. And uh, the second part is uh, social capital, uh, the second link. And um, there's a lot of research now that shows that um, uh, what I call the multiculturalism hypothesis, which comes from the Canadian uh, 1971 policy statement, that only when people are secure in their own identity or confident in their own identity will they be able to accept those people who are different from themselves. And if you reverse that, uh, you have the idea that when people feel threatened during contact situations, then they uh, will develop more negative relationships. So this is a further, uh, a further condition uh, that comes straight out of policy research here in Canada. But related to social capital, there's even a, another condition, and that is uh, when we're dealing with people who are members of ethnocultural communities, they have uh, the possibility of more than one cultural social network. They have their heritage culture and they have that of the larger society. And yet another hypothesis, which we now call the integration hypothesis, says that when people have social networks established, uh, receive support from and engage in competent interaction with more than one, usually their heritage uh, uh, group and the larger society, they do better uh, both interpersonally and 
uh, in psychological terms, uh, they have better self-esteem and they have uh, more uh, substantial uh, social, uh, social skills than if they only had social capital linked to one of those two groups. Hmm. So these are two other conditions, and I've mentioned the multiculturalism and the integration condition. We are going to talk extensively yep. about multiculturalism as yep. we move through the hour, but Gerald, I want to bring you into this. These conditions, there are many of them. Uh, how do you see contact theory? Is it, is it even relevant as a theory in practical uh, application? Well, I think it, it tends to focus a little too much of, on attitudes rather than interac actual interaction. Um, a lot of it was that in the middle of the 20th century, people wanted to get rid of prejudice for very good reasons. Um, but uh, it's, it's not really the attitude that matters so much as, as the interaction, uh, preferably good interaction. And, and initially, there will be uh, uh, friction and irritation sometimes and a sense of... Uh, the neighborhood ra changing around one, that, that kind of thing, which may indeed heighten some dislikes and, and mild conflict in the Canadian situation, not very grave conflict. Linda, I want to go to you and then I'll, I'll go to you, Lewis. Uh, tell me, is the, is the bar just too high for contact theory to really be relevant these days? I think there has been a lot of concern over the years that we'd have this increasingly long list of conditions that we have to meet. And this was actually part of the work that Thomas Pettigrew and I sought to try to sort out in our meta-analytic study of intergroup contact, where we basically found over 500 studies that examined the relationships between intergroup contact and prejudice reduction. And these studies come from many disciplines uh, from 38 different countries and include data from over 250,000 participants from the 1940s through the year 2000. And when we statistically pool those studies, what we find is that overall, as the contact theory would predict, greater contact is associated with less prejudice. And then we tried to look at those particular conditions that have been articulated as part of the history of contact theory. And what we found is that rather than it being one condition or another, that basically co positive contact produces more positive intergroup outcomes. And as I mentioned previously, those conditions appear to be functioning as facilitating conditions. That it's not that we need to meet every single condition in order to achieve positive outcomes, but that the more we're able to cultivate contact experiences that are structured in line with those conditions, the more likely those positive outcomes will occur. Well, I think the interesting thing that, that um, one of the interesting things that emerged from the meta-analytic study that you and Thomas Pettigrew did is that uh, the uh, conditions did not have to be satisfied in order for a positive effect to be shown. Uh, and I think the assumption had been before that um, uh, these conditions were somehow necessary conditions and, and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, and that was important in the larger theory to, ex to uh, provide a basis for explaining why in areas uh, or communities where there's a lot of contact, often there's a lot of prejudice. For example, I mean, if you uh, look at the southeast of the United States and compare it with the northwest, uh, you find more contact in the southeast and more racial prejudice, and you find uh, less contact in the northwest and less racial prejudice broadly speaking, and that was the puzzle that had to be resolved, and it was resolved by specifying conditions, but then it turns out that regardless of the conditions, the effect is positive. Linda, you want to hop in there, go ahead. Yeah, I, there's um, another piece that I think is really important to mention, and over the last 10 or 15 years or so, contact research has also shifted from focusing, focusing exclusively on those conditions, which I believe are still important and useful to consider, to also try to better understand people's emotions and motivations as they're interacting with members of other groups and really trying to understand what are the processes through which contact is effective in reducing prejudice. And what we find is that in particular, and echoing some of what John was talking about before, uh, contact is effective in helping to reduce our anxieties and feelings of threat in relation to the other group. And it also enhances our ability to engage in empathy and perspective taking so that when we have contact with members of other groups, it's not simply that we're changing our attitudes towards them, but we're actually contributing to restructuring the intergroup relationship that will be important for our future interfaces with that group, whether it involves our decisions about policies that would affect that group or future interactions or how we handle tense times when we might be on the brink of conflict. Lewis, hop in here. Are, are these guys on the right path in what they're saying? 
these guys know a lot more about this than I do. My experience <laughs> I should been, say gal as well. Well, guys and gals, they know a lot more about it than I do uh, in the sense that I, I'm not that familiar with the theory and with the writings that they are. My experience has been permit, principally on the ground in the U.S. and very much connected with the work I've done with Bob Putnam over the past 10 or 15 years. And in this instance, principally this one study to which uh, John or Don referred to before, it was a major study, 31,000 citizens across America in 41 different communities uh, done by a, a group of, put together by a group of academics and scholars from both Europe and the U.S. And its findings were uh, not so much uh, either in confirmation or a challenge to what we've talked about, but sort of at variance at a, at a different angle. Uh, and it's worth just saying a little bit more about that. The principal finding was not that the, uh, was that in the communities where the uh, immigration was highest, where the uh, diversity, the racial and ethnic diversity was highest, uh, there was not so much uh, more conflict in those communities, but what there was was greater amounts of anomie and social isolation. Uh, so it wasn't so much that immigrants were hostile to or more at, at variance with uh, uh, new, uh, natives or people who lived there a long time, but that they were isolated even from their own, uh, their own immigrant groups, as were in those communities as were the natives. So generally in those communities everybody voted less, gave to charity less, volunteered less, participated in civic life less, trusted people less, even in their own groups. Uh, the net effect of the, of the increasing diversity, at least in those communities, in this one survey we did, was one that uh, raised questions about the, a different kind of question about people. What you might say, uh, the term that uh, Bob Putnam's used, is that for the most part that people just seem to hunker down. And maybe it's not surprising that when surrounded by people who are different than us, many of us just withdraw. We pull back a little bit of uncertainty and fear. And so people, almost like a turtle, they pulled in their head, they went inside their shell. And the only activities that increased in those communities over the period we were studying were people protesting about civil life without much, with, with less belief they could make a change, but protesting, and watching television. People retreated at home and went to watch television. Okay, Lewis, we're going to and talk so that about... that was the effect. So we're going to talk about that turtling effect a little later on, but I want to shift gears a bit here and talk about uh, another group of people that contact theory may or may not apply to. And, you know, there's an extensive and growing body of research that says, uh, you know, knowing someone who is gay or lesbian or bisexual can substantially increase support for policies such as uh, same-sex marriage that are designed to promote equal rights for gay people. And I want to take a look at this. Take a look at this thing. It's a 2009 Gallup poll that illustrates support for same-sex marriage uh, in the United States. Take a look at these bars, especially uh, around the right-hand side of it. If you look at the middle first, support about uh, whether people who do or do not know personally someone who is gay for uh, same-sex marriage supports about average 49 47 percent is the split but look at the right hand column here if you know someone who personally who is gay the opposition uh pardon me if you know someone if you don't know someone who is personally gay the opposition to same-sex marriage skyrockets so linda it seems like a pretty good piece of evidence supporting contact theory doesn't it um, I think that's a, a classic example, and in fact, from our meta-analytic research, where we pulled together all of those studies, what we found is that the effects uh, for contact between heterosexuals and homosexuals actually revealed the strongest effects as compared to racial and ethnic groups, interactions between young people and the elderly, people with and without mental disabilities or mental illness. That there was something about the nature of the relationship between homosexuals and heterosexuals that seemed to show the strongest effects. And what I suspect is driving the effects is emotional in nature. That by the time um, heterosexuals know that they're interacting with someone who's gay, they've already cultivated some degree of relationship um, and this is research that Gregory Herrick has also looked at as well, that there's already some degree of trust, some degree of rapport, some investment in that relationship so that they're already motivated to, to uh, think positive thoughts 
about that group and also care about the welfare of members of that group. And I think that motivational component is hugely important when we're talking about contact effects. And I think it echoes some of what Lewis and John were talking about in terms of anxiety and threat and hunkering down on the one hand and being willing, willing to open up and care about and have concern for and empathize with the concerns of that group on the other hand. I think those are kind of competing forces that people are dealing with. Fundamentally, I think, you know, humans were pretty self-protective and we want to make sure that we're taken care of and that our groups are taken care of. And so when we do feel anxious or threatened, we might hunker down, we might be less willing to reach out. And I think this is a classic example of but when we start to cultivate those relationships across group boundaries, we don't only care about our group's concerns. We do care about them, but we also have space to care about other groups' welfare as well. Let me get a sense around this table here in Toronto. Are you reading the same things into the numbers that Linda's uh, reading into them? From Can other sources, other kinds of groups, we have um, uh, similar evidence. For example, in um, Canadian national surveys, uh, we know uh, that the more there are of a particular group in a neighborhood, the more positive are the attitudes of non-members of that group towards that group. Uh, this could be interpreted in two ways. One is uh, the contact potential, having lots of people, say, of German or Ukrainian or Icelandic origin in your neighborhood, uh, does lead, through contact theory, to more positive attitudes. The alternative explanation, of course, is that people move to neighborhoods where they happen to like Icelandics or, or other people. I think that's less plausible. There are many other reasons to move, but it, it is possible. But there's a further study that I'd, I'd just like to put on the table very recently by uh, Binder and, and Brown and so on, in which they actually looked at the direction of the relationship. Does contact lead to uh, reduced prejudice, or does initial lower levels of prejudice lead people to engage in contact? And they, in fact, found both. Uh, we're at work amongst um, high school students in uh, Belgium, uh, Germany, and, uh, and Britain. Uh, so it's a two-way street. And I guess the question, real question is how you, how you open up that, uh, to, to get people to enter into that street and move in the direction of greater contact based upon perhaps initially positive attitudes so that they can actually improve um, and make more positive their attitudes. Louis, you wanted to say something earlier. Jump in here. I wanted to ask Linda whether the, uh, the, the data on polling in this country in the U.S., which shows that the, the younger, people, the younger people are, the more likely they are to be comfortable with homosexual relationships, with uh, gay marriage and so forth. Is that confirmation of the mm -hmm. greater exposure and contact to people of different relations and help make your point? I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know that I would personally be inclined to reduce national data to any one variable. I think that contact mm -hmm. can have positive effects, but I think there have also been other changing social and cultural norms, different representations mm -hmm. of gays and lesbians mm -hmm. in the media, for example, um, whether it's direct, direct, uh, like face-to-face -face contact as what mm -hmm. we usually think about in social psychology or more vicarious forms of contact through the media. Um, I think there might be a, a com conglomerate of social forces that are leading to this tendency. And I think it would actually be really nice to have a better understanding of the extent to which each can uniquely predict those positive outcomes. How much of it seems to be due to contact and how much of it might be due to these other cultural factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that ethnic groups are fairly different from groups of sexual orientation. After all, everybody of whatever sexual orientation is born into a family and probably into some larger group. They all go to school together. Uh, so mm -hmm. to some extent, it, it can be said that there is such a thing as a gay community, but that is something that in a way is people, people move into uh, for whatever causes, whether through choice or, or otherwise. Uh, or genetic differences, but nonetheless, they are already in contact with non-homosexuals. Uh, so I, I think that that's a rather different from an immigrant community that has difficulty with English or whatever the dominant language is. Well, I want to go ahead. And, and it's also interesting uh, in this connection to, to think of uh, the, the hypothesis in relation to um, attitudes uh, toward gender roles. Uh, um, I mean, we're all familiar with prejudices 
about women and about men and so on. And, and uh, uh, the, when this, the, the contact theory or contact hypothesis is stated very broadly, uh, it should cover uh, groups as, that are male or female as much as ethnic groups or uh, groups uh, defined by their sexual orientation or age groups or whatever. And yet, routinely, the, the uh, uh, the, the uh, questions raised by sexual or gender prejudices are excluded from consideration. And that's, uh, that's a, a, a curious fact about, it seems to me, about the research in this field. Well, the species wouldn't go on if there weren't contact. So. <laughs> right, but there's a lot of contact <laughs> and, and a lot of prejudice. And, uh, and that's another debate. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, let me try this one out with you. Does contact theory work on the national level? And what I mean by that you know, when you look at experiences with neighboring countries that have had historical grievances, if you think of India and Pakistan or the Balkans or mm -hmm. the Israelis and Palestinians, does contact theory work, so to speak, in those cases? I think, I think it's a complex issue. I think when we look at the effects of having contact between Israelis and Palestinians, or for example, between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, there are actually a number of very positive effects, and some that might be somewhat surprising. Um, just to give the Northern Ireland case as an example, there's actually some research to suggest that even among those who have personally suffered as a result of the Troubles, um, for example, people who lost family members during violent conflict in Northern Ireland, those who had had close friends in the other community actually were more willing to trust, more willing to forgive, more willing to work toward peace and reconciliation as compared to those who had not had close relations in the other community. So I think even in the face of conflict, there are some positive benefits to be gained by having positive contact experiences. but. I think we need to take contact in the context of these other social forces that are at play. And as I had alluded to previously, I think there's simultaneously these positive and negative forces that are kind of competing against each other. And then on the one hand, if people are feeling threatened by the presence of another group or feel that that other group is a threat to their access to resources or to the way they want to live their lives, then that puts a very strong burden on any positive contact experiences that people might have had. And we actually can see in some of our research studies people almost struggling with these two tendencies. For example, uh, I've done some research with colleagues in South Africa, and what we find is that white South Africans who have had co positive contact with black South Africans are more likely to support policies that would promote black advancement, whether they're compensatory policies that provide training programs for black South Africans, or for example, more preferential policies, which be closer to our affirmative action programs here in the United States. And here we also included measures of these white South Africans' prejudices, their feelings of threat posed by black South Africans. And what we find is that contact is still uniquely predicting more support for these policies that would promote black South Africans, but you also see the role of threat and you also see the role of prejudice. So that there seem to be these competing motivations that people are struggling with. And what I think, one of the reasons why I think contact is really important is because it serves as a ballast or as a counterpoint to that self-interest or to that group interest. That instead of only focusing on our group's interest, we might at least take a moment to pause and think about the welfare of the others before we engage in conflict or before we take next steps forward. And that could potentially mean the difference between trying to come up with more creative, non-violent strategies towards conflict resolution or engaging in more direct contact or conflict strategies. John Barry, is uh, contact theory uh, you know, a solution to some of the world's trouble spots? Is it a way to move forward? I'm not sure at the international level where there's a long-standing history of military and other kinds of conflict. But if we bring it down to more manageable uh, situations, such as in Northern Ireland, and possibly in uh, West Asia, uh, we can draw upon research here in Canada between English and French Canadians. Uh, <clears throat> there's a long history of research on contact and on threat uh, uh, with respect to these two groups. And it was only a, a few decades ago that we were in a fairly overt uh, conflict situation. 
So for example, I don't know if you remember, there used to be a group for the, called the Alliance for the Preservation of English in Canada. Um, uh, with a student, I infiltrated that organization. <laughs> we joined it and uh, got them to participate in, a, in survey research. Hope you didn't act as an agent provocateur. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we were absolutely <laughs> neutral in the uh, in the way we re approached it. But very clearly, their antagonism towards uh, bilingualism and towards the enhancing the relative position economically and socially and politically in Canada of French uh, francophone Canadians was based entirely on a sense that they were going to be. Uh, they were being threatened and were going to be absorbed. They wrote a book called Bilingual Today, French Tomorrow. And uh, this f uh, sense of threat was economic. They thought they'd lose their jobs. It was cultural. They thought they'd lose their identity. And it was uh, 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 personal. They, they, uh, they felt uh, that they, they, they could not get along with, uh, with people. Uh, but decades of research on uh, school exchanges, on um, bilingual education, um, which brings the Anglophone and Francophone communities together, has shown that uh, in almost all circumstances, uh, almost all of these studies, uh, improved relationships occur. So these are not nation states, but they are nations in the, in the sense of, of distinct communities reflecting on themselves and having hostility being reduced by contact. Donald. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't uh, disagree with what you're saying about the uh, effects of contact on the individuals who have the contact, whether it's students who are on exchange programs or, or um, you know, wherever uh, that, 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 that those contacts take place. But uh, I, th I think that our own experience uh, would illustrate that that's not much of a solution to uh, the problems that we face, that, that, uh, that the uh, threat of um, posed by the separatist movement in Quebec has gone up and down um, in response to factors other than the amount of contact between Anglophones and Francophones and, and, uh, and, and that whatever effects the contact has on the individuals who have the contact, it doesn't have much effect on the relations between the groups. Or the artificial when, kinds of contacts a, like that as opposed to uh, actual coexistence in the island of Montreal and all the complexities of of allophones wanting to speak English and going to French schools. Right. I, I think that that does provide a kind of contact, but the two weeks in Ontario or, or two weeks in Quebec is, is not really going to change the politics. Louis, you want to say something? Yes, as an example uh, of uh, places where the, uh, the contacts, albeit limited initially to a small group, have actually uh, burgeoned into to something larger, there's a group called the Concord Coalition uh, that's based at Harvard in Southern California that's documented 120 different uh, case studies around the country where groups have tried to work together across ethnic groups, often in, in situations of high tension and, and even hatred. And I mention it because what's interesting about it is that they have developed a, a very s substantial and interesting and sophisticated set of how you negotiate in exactly these situations where lives are at risk, where talking to someone from the other side can r literally get you killed and get your family killed, and how they can negotiate across that, building on the contacts, and eventually, and not easily, and not always, building the capacity to work together and ultimately to touch a larger community. And in fact, when you look at some of the experience in Belfast and the, in the efforts, to, uh, in the end, a lot of the key negotiations took place between not the moderates because the brokers found out they couldn't move with the moderates. They had to bring in the, the most outrageous uh, and extreme people on both sides, people who are doing prison time. And then they had to find ways to protect the prisoners from others in their own community finding out about them being involved until they could figure out how they could gradually let the word out to others that these discussions were going forward. So the contact there was critical and it did overcome uh, the decades of hatred. My American friends, we're going to talk a little bit about Canada because the three gentlemen here have all raised the term multiculturalism, which is a, a big part of our country. It, feel free to chime in. But I just want to read this quotation about Canadian multi multiculturalism. Canadian multiculturalism is fundamental to our belief that all citizens are equal. And multiculturalism ensures that all citizens can keep their identities, can take pride in their ancestry and have a sense of belonging. Acceptance gives Canadians a feeling of security and self-confidence, making them more open to and accepting of diverse cultures. The Canadian experience has shown that multiculturalism encourages racial and ethnic harmony and cross-cultural understanding. John, you've mentioned multiculturalism several times. 
what extent, though, does it really underpin our multiculturalism policies here in Canada? How does contact theory underpin our multiculturalism theory here in Canada? There are two fundamental planks to the 1971 multiculturalism statement to the House. One is the right where uh, cultural communities so wish to maintain a sense of continuity with their heritage and their identity. Uh, but often overlooked is the second plank, and that is um, the wish to promote intercultural contact, uh, equitable contact, equal status contact, uh, in order to uh, achieve the ultimate goal of the policy, which is greater intercultural harmony. One of the problems that uh, we see worldwide uh, is a misunderstanding that multiculturalism is only that first plank, that is to say the existence of many different cultural communities uh, in a society, without equal emphasis on the promotion of contact and the reduction of barriers to such contact. And I think the Canadian version of multiculturalism, which is different from that being practiced in Europe or failed in Europe, um, is that we emphasize this second component, which is essentially a contact and participation component in the pursuit of intercultural harmony. So I really do think that it's, it's, uh, it's fundamental to our sense of who we are and where we're going to be going uh, in running a, a culturally diverse society. Gerald, is this what's underpinning our success at multiculturalism or challenges here in Canada? I, I have grave doubts as to the uh, importance of the multiculturalism policy for good or ill. I think it's a, a proposed public doctrine, uh, but the rates of assimilation, at least as measured by adapting to the prevailing language, seems to be about the same as in the United States, um, where there is no multiculturalism doctrine except maybe in universities and places like that. Um, I, I think that, if I may use a Marxist term, uh, multiculturalism is largely false consciousness. Uh, it probably did some good service for a couple of decades when uh, we had given up a uh, pretty explicitly racist immigration policy up until the 1960s, uh, and the effects of that started changing. That probably did need to show respect towards uh, visible minorities. but. Um, uh, I, I, I think that we, it doesn't do the harm that some people claim of creating ghettos because I think it's very hard to keep yourself in a ghetto in this mass media, compulsory education society and, and all the workplaces that people find themselves in. So I think assimilation does take place regardless of what ideological construct is. is could, I, could I respond to ahead, uh, one part of that? Um, there is a third plank in the 1971 statement. The policy was called a policy of multiculturalism within a bilingualism framework. And it came only two years after the Official Languages Act. The third plank is the encouragement of everyone to learn either or both of the official languages. And the reason for that is that you cannot fully participate in Canadian society publicly or privately very often unless you have access to one of the official languages. So acquiring one of these languages uh, is not necessarily an indication of assimilation. It's entirely consistent with the goal set out in the original policy. Linda Trapp, let me ask you this. Uh, Gerald mentioned this idea of uh, sort of ghettoization, this, is, this living in sort of what might be called pluralistic monoculturalism. Is there a risk of this pluralistic monoculturalism rather than true multiculturalism in Canada or, 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 or in the U.S. for that matter? I think there is. Um, I think one of the concerns is, as I was listening and, and thinking about, one of the concerns is that if we have kind of a public statement uh, supporting diversity or supporting multiculturalism, I wonder about the extent to which it actually filters down to the individuals themselves, and particularly when we're dealing with groups of different statuses. Um, what you often hear among members of ethnic minority groups, particularly in the United States, is, yeah, I hear that rhetoric, but why should I trust it? Why should I trust that's really how people feel or that I'll actually be treated with the respect that I deserve just as anyone else would, would, would deserve? And so I think there's oftentimes a discrepancy. And I think this actually also relates back to all ports conditions, this idea of having institutional support or supportive norms for this exchange or integration across groups that oftentimes members of different groups as a function of their experiences have really different perceptions and expectations of what that context represents and what those interactions will be like. So 
members of a dominant or a majority group might come to that context and say, oh, that went fine. We're all equals here. Whereas members of ethnic minority or subordinate groups might not be able to trust or feel really confident that they will be treated as equals in that context, even if it is said officially as on the pu public record. Luz Feldstein, are you seeing the same things in your country that uh, Linda's talking about? Oh, I'm, I'm struck by the difficulty of particularly some groups as they come into this country to find any kind of purchase at all and therefore to find great confidence that as to what a route is and a way out or a way into the society. Uh, I don't think assimilation is, is often or almost ever used as the term. It's, it's at best we can hope for integration. And there, uh, it depends heavily often on the group building some kind of confidence and competence within itself first. Enough strength, what we talk about is bonding, so that they can then move to bridging, to connecting with the larger society. But you may not be able to get to the second without the first, without the, without the cohesiveness and the uh, respect given to the individual community itself. But that may be equally true in Canada. I, wouldn't, I just don't know it well enough. Don, what you're hearing Linda and Lewis talk about the U.S. when you compare it to Canada, what stands out for you? Do we have it right here in Canada? Well, I th I'm, I'm basically uh, want to agree with what Gerald was saying earlier, that, uh, that I don't think that the official policy, the declaration of, uh, from um, uh, 1971 that's been referred to is, and the policies that flowed directly from that are, are, um, have been in themselves very important. And, and secondly, that, that, that the um, patterns uh, of integration or assimilation or um, uh, sorting into somewhat different uh, 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 residential communities are very different in the United States from they are, what they are in Canada. I think the, the processes are very similar. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm inclined to say that that multiculturalism is, is, is a very important fact about Canada, but it's a fact about our demography and a fact about our false consciousness and not a very important fact about our policies. Could, could, could Gerald, I go ahead okay. and then I'll hop in yeah. with John. Yeah. Go ahead, Gerald. Well, some people have said that because Americans are allegedly, and there's some evidence for this, more extroverted, that they're actually more likely to talk to people uh, rather than Canadians. Uh, the Canadian, Canadian Indian writer, uh, Bharati Mukherjee, felt, expressed this very strongly some, some years ago, that she felt liberated moving from Canada to the United States because people talked to her. Uh, we had multiculturalism and shy, reserved, occasionally violent and hockey and other, <laughs> uh, other activities, but, um, but reserved Canadians who aren't, very, aren't necessarily very forthcoming. I'm not very forthcoming. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> John, go ahead. I wanted to refer back to one of the conditions that Linda mentioned, and that came from Allport originally, and that is where there are norms, uh, including laws, uh, that um, uh, encourage and support uh, contact and its outcome. And of course, these policies and all of the dozens of programs that implement the policies are a normative framework within which people uh, can operate. Uh, and secondly, uh, public opinion polls, uh, getting at the degree of tolerance and openness and acceptance of uh, uh, communities of each other in Canada are uniformly uh, very much on the positive side. Uh, and this also serves as a kind of normative framework within which people can engage in contact. If you look at Michael Adams' book, uh, The Unlikely Utopia, The Triumph of Pluralism in Canada, he documents over a period of about 20 years the very high level of uh, normative uh, support for intergroup contact, uh, which can follow this sense of security or confidence that you get from being engaged in your heritage culture. So I think there is this uh, other condition, the normative framework within which we can operate. I don't think it's false consciousness. A lot of people are aware of it uh, in the field work that I do. It's, it's right up front. In fact, in a, in a paper that uh, was just published uh, two weeks ago in uh, Canadian Ethnic Studies, the very core, uh, national sample of 2,000 people, the very core of Canadian identity is uh, our multicultural and open uh, character, even though we may not be as extroverted as other people in expressing it.
Hmm. Okay, we have less than 10 minutes left, and I want to go back to a point that, Lewis, you mentioned earlier. I want to bring up one more quotation. Just take a listen to this. Uh, this is an excerpt from a lecture by Lewis's colleague, Robert Putnam, and that deals with this issue of diversity. Here's what it says. Diversity does not produce bad race relations or ethnically defined group hostilities, our findings suggest. Rather, inhabitants of diverse communities tend to withdraw from collective life, to distrust their neighbours, regardless of the colour of their skin, to withdraw even from close friends, to expect the worst from their community and its leaders, to volunteer less, give less to charity and work on community projects less often, to register to vote less, to agitate for social reform more, but have less faith that they can actually make a difference and to huddle unhappily in front of the television. Diversity, at least in the short run, seems to bring out the turtle in all of us. Linda, there is a lot in that quote, but, you know, perhaps one of the most unexpected findings of Putnam was that in diverse settings, how much whites trust other whites or blacks trust other blacks or Asians trust other Asians is lower. And in other words, I guess the question is, if you don't trust people who, who do look like us, what happens? How do you respond to Putnam's assessment? So here I would actually distinguish between what we would call opportunities for contact, living in relatively diverse communities, and the actual experience of having face-to-face -face contact with members of other groups. And there have been some political scientists and some social psychologists who have actually looked at both variables at the same time. And what these types of studies generally show is that when people are in diverse communities, but they don't necessarily have substantial meaningful contact with members of the other group, they see that other group as more threatening. But when there are those opportunities for contact and they actually do have meaningful interactions with other groups, then they tend to have more positive attitudes, feel more trust, greater willingness to live in integration in the future, et cetera. And so I think, again, it gets at this issue of how are we actually defining contact? And I think oftentimes when we cross disciplines, we're defining contact in somewhat different ways. I know in social psychology, we tend to focus more on face-to-face -face interactions, whereas in other disciplines, oftentimes it's considered more in terms of these proportional indices or representations of the population. But I think fundamentally, um, what it all gets back to is this issue of anxiety and threat on the one hand and wanting to reach out on the other. And I think for me, um, I find Abraham Maslow's idea of the hierarchy of needs very useful. That, you know, humans were self protective. We have some very basic needs that we want to have met needs for food and shelter and security. So, to the extent that we're still seeking those needs or feel that another group poses a threat to those needs, we'll be more likely to engage in conflict. But to the extent that we're able to feel safe and secure in our environments, then we're actually interested in reaching out. We're open and curious about other people's perspectives. But I think we need to have that sense of security in order to do so. Lewis is Linda, right? We just need to feel safe and then we'll reach out? Well, it's clear that, that one of the factors is a pe person's sense of security. And it's also clear that, as she points out very effectively, Proximity doesn't do it by itself. And studies of interracial housing projects in the UK and the US both show that increased uh, mixing, integration, whatever you want to call it, in those housing projects makes no difference at all in the connections among people or their trust in one another. You've got to make conscious efforts. Interestingly, in the, in the US, the two institutions that have been most effective at bridging these kinds of gaps have been two you would not expect, and that's the U.S. military and uh, the, uh, some of the, the, the big ecumenical churches uh, which have been able to do this. And they have done it uh, with, quite a, with great effectiveness and managed to build trust where people had to work with one another and where they then created norms and some of the, the uh, principles referred to by others before within which people could build trust. How have they done it? How has the military done that? Well, as I say, they, they've started, first of all, they've started with a command and control system. That helps. And you might say the church has that as well, a different kind of command and control. But then in addition, uh, they then create a set of norms that expect people to work acro across uh, all kinds of divisions, and they literally prescribe how that's to be done. And they make it clear that part of operating within that system is to be, is to 
work within these principles, and those principles then guarantee you a certain degree of security if you do that. You can't advance or work in those systems without following the rules, and the rules, in effect, uh, are fairly severe about uh, violating some of the basic language and ways in which you might otherwise slight somebody. And so they have worked by all the polls and surveys of people within those two institutions. There's an increased amount of trust among people, regardless of race or uh, ethnic difference. Linda, pick up from there. You're nodding your head. One of the key issues is this focus on norms and having trust in those norms and how they'll be applied equally to everybody in that context. I think that's one of the crucial issues as to why the military has been so effective in improving interracial relations, because you know, in order to advance, it doesn't matter who is in your battalion or who you're partnered with, you have to do your job and that is what, that, those are the criteria on which you will be evaluated. I think sports teams are another great example. The groups aren't necessarily brought together because they want to engage in interracial dialogue, but they're brought together for this common goal. They're working interdependently to achieve that goal and the metric of success is what they can all contribute together and they don't get any benefit out of not getting along with each other. I think those are some of the crucial reasons why it's so important. And so buying in to those norms is crucially important. And in fact, in some of our research and others, what we find is that ethnic minorities and majorities often have different responses to those norms. That in particular, ethnic minorities in the United States are not necessarily more positively inclined toward diversity because they value diversity, oh, I'm sorry, more positively inclined toward intergroup contact because they value diversity or because they believe the society values diversity, but because they believe that the whites they're about to interact with value diversity. So again, there's this issue of the objective conditions or setting and the subjective responses to that and the extent to which people feel that they can trust the true intentions of those people in that shared society. John Barry, I'm going to give you the last uh, word. Well, I think one institution, public institution, hasn't really been mentioned, and that, of course, is the raison d'etre TVO, and that's the public educational system. Uh, in Canada, we don't really have a military that uh, has ever, uh, I think, served that role uh, of uh, bringing people together, but our public educational system has. And it seems to me that the multicultural education uh, campaign to uh, allow everybody to find themselves in one large system to bring people into day-to-day -day contact within the schools is probably our best hope for uh, the integrative or multicultural goal that has been set for us uh, over these past few decades. Great debate. Thanks to all five of you. Louis Feldstein in Manchester, New Hampshire. Linda Tropp in Springfield, Massachusetts. John Barry here in Toronto, professor of psychology emeritus from Queen's University. Next to him, Gerald Owen, journalist with The Globe and Mail and Donald Forbes, Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. Thank you all very much.